Thank you so much for inviting me. That was a really lovely introduction. And thank you for organizing all this and putting it together. I'm really excited to share uh, our work here with everyone. Um, and that's also, it's really awesome that you recognize uh, the work from my PhD on ergodicity breaking. It seems like um, information from long, long ago. Uh, and since then, I've, I've really wandered along quite far from the single particle tracking world. Um, and like you mentioned, I'm, I'm now leading the COSIM project team. And so I'll share the work uh, that we're doing here today uh, using automated approaches uh, to segment all the cellular organelles within volumetric electron microscopy. All right, so if we, we look inside of a cell, really the defining characteristic of all things is, is a cell. And cells are this fundamental unit of life and focusing on the cell really permits us a detailed understanding of the tissues and the organisms that the cell comprises. Now within the cell are organelles, they're the building blocks, and from highly specialized cells within tissue to plant cells to immortalized cancer cells, even simple unicellular organisms such as protozoa, at the foundational level, all of these cells contain organelles. And they have the same basic functions, right? So DNA is packed inside the nucleus, proteins are synthesized on the ER, and mitochondria generate ATP to fuel the cell. Historically, light microscopy has brought us a long way to understanding organelles and their functions. The beauty of light microscopy is that it grants us protein specificity and we get to see things in time. So it allows us to see organelle dynamics and how they interact with each other. Uh, and we get global context, right? So we can see all the organelles within the entire cell. However, we are limited by resolution and by protein labeling. So we only get a few probes at a time, even with fancy you know, uh, it, tricks with, with spectral and mixing and such. So if we look at electron microscopy, this now offers us global contrast and higher resolution, but with traditional approaches, um, it usually limits the amount of volume that we can investigate. So we, we still lose context. We're not able to image the entire cell. So a valuable tool that selects some of the best of both worlds is a focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy. So here we get near isotropic resolution, we get global contrast, and thanks to the ingenuity of the HESS lab, we can now do this across large volumes. So not only do we gain resolution, but we also retain context. So here are some examples of amazing large volume high resolution data sets that are being produced here at Genelia by the Hess Lab and the FIBSEM Technology Group. So these data sets are rich with information and they're just begging to be extracted. But because of their size and their detail, <laughs> extracting that information is a mountain of a task in and of itself. Now we can zoom in just a little bit here um, and take a closer look. So this is a roughly one cubic micron volume and it's centered around the centrosome and a HeLa cell. So you can see in this data set, there's the Golgi in red and the ER in green. The vesicles are kind of scattered throughout in orange and microtubules are streaming through. Um, we also have the nucleus, nuclear pores, it's all super compact, super beautiful. And you might notice that there's really a lack of empty space here, even inside this just cubic micron, right? So that's actually the bottleneck because there's so much information. Um, so the caveat to having all this information is that it can make trying to extract it even harder than we ever thought possible. Um, and it's really quite overwhelming. Um, and it's, it's, it's the roadblock that's been stopping us. So for instance, for this, this cubic micron here, um, it takes a human annotator, and this is an expert annotator, probably about a week to 10 days, which is an optimistic estimate to, to annotate this whole block. So if we extrapolate that to the entire cell, this means it would take 50 to 100 years to segment all of these structures within a single cell. Obviously not possible because that's just a single cell and you know how do we, we ever scale that? So enter COSEM <laughs> within Genilia, we have uh, some of the world leading experts in machine learning and cell biology and large volume high resolution EM data acquisition. 
at their intersect lies this really unique area of research, and COSIM is expanding that intersect. We're driving forward our tools and knowledge with respect to identifying subcellular structures within EM data in an automated way. As a result, the products that COSIM provides include quantitative analytics and data resources, and it allows us to reimagine our canonical textbook image of the inside of a cell. It provides biological insight and knowledge, and it does this in a way that is open and accessible to the broader scientific community and to the public. So COSIM is a highly collaborative team. We include members from uh, scientific computing and project technical resource resources within Genelia, as well as the Saalfeld and the Funky Labs. Our pipeline begins after the data has been collected. So with the raw EM data, uh, we pre-process it using pipelines developed by Stefan Saalfeld and now in collaboration with Stefan Preibisch. And from there, skilled annotators carefully classify each and every voxel within that sub-block. So these segmentations are fed into machine learning algorithms as training data. The prediction, uh, prediction output from these algorithms are evaluated, they're refined, and in some scenarios they're used as a tool for other pipelines, such as CLEM registration. So once we have the predicted whole cell segmentations, we can do quantitative analytics of subcellular distributions, of interactions, sizes, morphologies. All of this information can be acquired. And then most importantly, all of this data and software is being made publicly available for viewing and downloading um, on our data portal, openorganelle.org. So I'll walk you through the pipeline using one of our HeLa cells as an example. So we'll start here with the aligned EM data. So Grace and Allison in the group have manually classified every voxel in a subblock with up to 37 different classes of substructures. So you can see some of those here. And here's an example of what those substructures are. So we include all the distinguishable, dis distinguishable membrane-bound organelles. So from the popular and easier organelles such as mitochondria and plasma membrane to the trickier things like ER and Golgi and lipid droplets and the endosite endolysosomal system. We also include cytoskeletal elements like the microtubules. We include uh, nuclear components such as chromatin, the nucleolus, and the nuclear pores. And we also include um, ribosomes as a classifier. So what we have here are 15 of those subblocks, and the class labels have been color coded there um, on the left side of the screen. So all 37 classes are listed here in this graph on the right, um, which depicts how much uh, training data we have for each of these object classes. So I'll highlight here that we use different combinations of classes for different machine learning setups. So we tested whether training all 37 classes together, which would be all the bars in the graph, versus some, which would be the green bars, versus individual, which would be the bars with the white dots, um, affects the prediction results. So you can also see in the bottom graph that the amount of training data acquired uh, from each data set that we had. So even in the cell that um, has the most training data, which is the cell I'm showing now, only a fraction of a percent of the entire cell volume is annotated for training data. So really not that much. So the training data it, that I just showed is then used to train machine learning classifiers. We use a mostly standard setup with a 3D unit architecture, as you can see here in the middle. This is trained by repeatedly feeding in blocks of raw data. That produces some output for the innermost part of the block, so the orange part here, which is then compared to what it should look like according to the ground truth annotations, and the parameters of the network are adjusted accordingly. This process is repeated hundreds of thousands of times in our case, and specifically, we train it to predict a sine um, hyperbolic tangent dis distance transform of the binary label for each organelle. So you might remember this um, was done previously with, with Stefan and Larissa for the synapse and the FAFB data sets. So these distance tran transforms can be transformed back into binary segmentations by thresholding at zero. So here this just illustrates for the mitos in blue and the ER in green, but as I mentioned, we trained a number of these networks where we change how many organelles are actually trained simultaneously. So we have a setup where we train all the classes together, one where we only include the classes that are covered by a lot of the training blocks, and then also setups with just a few related classes at a time. 
define the optimal setup as well as the iteration for each label and data set, the networks need to be evaluated independent of the training data. So we experimented with two ways of doing this. First, the classic approach, which uh, computing metrics on additional annotations. So for this, annotators manually annotated four cubic micron holdout blocks in each of our four data sets. And we then pulled the predictions on the holdout block region and evaluated. We used the F1 score, aka the dice score, which falls between zero and one and is based on measuring pixel overlap. So higher is better here. The results I'm showing are for a subgroup of the organelles where we have directly comparable data for each network type. So predictions that were above a threshold and available in the holdout blocks that were produced. So for each network, there are four points in this graph for the four data sets that were used. Rather than showing the, the average of them, we showed this showed them showed all four so you could see the spread across the data sets. What's reported here are the test scores. So for each point, the iteration was optimized using the average over the remaining three blocks. So generally speaking, we saw not a large effect, but overall there was a hint of a trend that having more classes seemed to perform better. Uh, the large spread for some organelles has, has two possible causes uh, we propose. One being the obvious scenario that uh, there's a real difference in the performance. And then the less obvious scenario um, in that the sampling of space is poor when using the validation blocks. So this is especially true for things like mitochondria, which are much larger than the four microns that we can capture that were within the holdout block. So some downsides to this approach is we can only directly compare structures in this manner that are covered by all the validation blocks. So with this, with this automated approach to scoring, some of the downsides is that we can only directly compare structures in this manner that are covered by all the validation blocks. So also um, there's an overlap-based measures, an overlap-based measure, measure such as the dice score um, can appear overly pessimistic for things that are really thin, like membranes and microtubules. Um, but maybe most importantly, um, as Luciano was just saying, generating these additional annotations is extremely expensive as well as um, just super inefficient. And in terms of sampling the variability within a data set, as well as allowing us to scale. Um, so it, it's really not a way to, to go blindly into a new data set because then we'd have to generate these, these massive holdout blocks that really aren't even um, good enough for, for what we need to, to score. Um, so for all of these reasons, our favorite approach really relies on a manual comparison between the predictions. So to do this, I, to do this, this manual evaluation, uh, David and the group implemented a custom Fiji plugin for us to pairwise compare do for two different predictions at a time. So first the user selects two predictions to compare as well as an organelle class to evaluate. So I'm showing the ER here. And as the movie is showing, a random crop is then chosen from the volume, cropped, thresholded at a distance of zero and overlaid on the raw data. So the user inspects the stacks and selects which prediction, if any, did a better job um, of predicting. We'll note here that the crops are randomly labeled, so the user is blind to which image came from which prediction. Um, and the plugin calculates and reports a p-value corresponding to the null hypothesis that the two networks perform equally well. So this evaluation process then repeats for a new crop and evaluations are performed until after a minimum of 100 evaluations, we can reject the null, hypo null hypothesis and the network that performed best is deemed the winner. So no ties are allowed. And we use this manual evaluation to back up our conclusions that we reached with the automated evaluation metrics. And that's that most of the time, the combined networks such as the all or many um, outperform outperform the few networks. So the more classes trained together, seemingly the better. Using the setups optimized via the manual evaluation, we can then generate predictions on the entire data set, so the exciting part. So we threshold them and thereby produce segmentations. Now these segmentations are perfect yet. Um, there's always more work to do and in some types of errors, the network makes, um, they're relatively easy to fix. So for instance, we can do techniques techniques such as size filtering, picking only the largest connected component, which works really well for things that are really big, like the nucleus or things that are all connected, like the ER. And 
or we can do something like what was showing on the right, which is improving the instance segmentation with a watershed algorithm. So, so far, all relatively uh, straightforward stuff. For the case of microtubules, Nils and Jan's lab um, was able to improve the predictions quite a bit by applying a technique he developed that incorporates structural biases for the microtubules. So this method depends on solving a discrete optimization code um, with associated parameters. Um, so there was the data-dependent evidence prior, a stiffness factor, which controls how much deviations from a straight line are punished, a start edge prior, which defines the cost for starting and ending a trajectory, a negative selection prior, uh, which is needed to avoid the trivial solution of selecting no edges and no vertices, and a data threshold can for can candidate extraction. Um, and then lastly, a distance threshold below which um, the two candidates are connected by a candidate edge. So these hyperparameters are used for each cross-validation run um, and found through a good search over the a two by two by two micron uh, microtubule validation block. So what we have in red here. So in order to test the applicability to our data, um, Nils compared his method to a baseline method. So we wanted to make sure all this extra work was worth it. So the baseline that he compared to consisted of first thresholding the microtubule predictions, then morphologically closing um, the thresholded predictions, doing connected component analysis, then size filtering of the connected components, and then skeletonizing um, each of the connected components and restricting the skeleton to have no branches because they are microtubules. So he evaluated the reconstructed microtubule tracks against the baseline in terms of topological errors. And in each case, you can see that uh, Nils methods perform better than the baseline. So they're by positively improving the microtubule segmentation for both false, false positives and false negatives, um, especially for splits and also for merges. He also evaluated the performance using pre precision recall and F1 um, metrics. And the results here are all in agreement as well uh, in that the, his method worked uh, improved above the baseline. So from here, um, since these were all skeletonizations, uh, we used the refined microtubule predictions and expanded the microtubule tracks to create tubes um, with an inner radius of 6 nanometers and an outer radius of 12 and a half nanometers. So now we can combine all these predictions, all these refinements, and we're able to get really nice segmentations for a number of organelles. And this worked pretty well across the four data sets that were our main focus. So what's really exciting about these predictions is we can start to see organelles in a way that we've never done before. So let's, for instance, just take a look at the Golgi, which is one of my favorite organelles. Uh, the, the textbook shape of the Golgi is really this cute little stack. It has five to seven neat cisternae. It has a clear cis and trans face. However, when we look at you know, the entirety of the Golgi and a whole mammalian cell, uh, what we have is actually something much more complex and I would argue much more beautiful. So those seven cisternae that we typically see in the textbook images and actuality you know, weave into and around and through each other. And what we may find as the first cisternae in one stack actually becomes the last cisternae of another stack. You can see the vesicles that are studded around the edges. And you can also see how intimately connected the ER is with this entire system. And at times it can be hard to distinguish one from the other. All of these complexities are completely lost in textbook cartoons and nearly impossible to resolve from light data. So this is really quite exciting to just be able to visualize in and of itself. However, you know, these segmentations are really more than just a pretty picture. So we can also start to quantify the information from them as well. So for instance, we can look at the percent volume occupied by each organelle class across different cell types. So you can see the nucleus occupies the most space in all cells, maybe not surprisingly. Um, and it's especially so for jerkets, which are, which are an immortalized T cell of sort. Um, also, if we look at the ER, you can see that it's much larger in the macrophage cell. Um, which agrees with it being a highly, highly secretory cell. So I'll walk through three different analysis examples um, that we've done as well here. So first is the contact sites between microtubules and other organelles in the cell. So you can see the microtubule here and the color coded are the organelles and the single microtubule is touching. 
So this particular microtubule is only about a micron in length, um, and it's really quite busy. We can quantify these contacts for all of the microtubules in the cell, and those results are in the graph down below. So then I'll show you an analysis of membrane curvature. So for this, David took the ER predictions and iteratively thinned them to produce a medial surface. He could then calculate the curvature of that surface and threshold between planar, which is in green, and tubular, which is in purple regions of the ER. So anecdotally, we notice two things here. A highly secretory cell, such as the macrophage, has much more planar peripheral ER regions than a HeLa cell. Um, also, we noticed that there seems to be an affinity between the planar regions of the ER and mitochondria contact sites in HeLa cells. So as you can see in this movie when it pauses, the contact sites in blue seem to match up with the mitochondria in orange. And in fact, when we analyze the contact sites for the whole cell, we see that in HeLa cells, the planar regions of ER are most always supported by mitochondria, while in the macrophage, which has a more canonical stacked helicoidal sheets, uh, mitochondrial support is not readily observed. So the third analysis example is with ribosome classification. So we started with all of the ribosomes, and then David first classified them as ER bound or cytosolic, and then he further classified them based on the ER curvature which they were bound to. And so you can see those distributions here, and what we found interesting is that um, it seemed that ribosomes that were on more planar regions of ER tended to form polyribosome, cha polyribosome chains. So Everything that I've shown so far has been with high resolution data where the voxel size is about four nanometers. Um, and this is thanks to you know, the FIBSIM platform that the HESS lab has made. However, uh, we didn't want to restrict ourselves to the very high resolution data because most FIBSIM data is still acquired with a voxel size of eight nanometers because it's much quicker to acquire that data. So we're able to reuse our four nanometer training data to train a second set of a second set of networks where we roughly simulate what the eight nanometer versions of the raw data would look like by randomly sampling the data on the input side. So with those networks, we we're able to reduce four, na four nanometer segmentations on eight nanometer data. So here are the evaluations for the eight nanometer networks compared to our four nanometer networks. Again, we see a pretty similar performance between the two networks. So that's cool. Um, and an interesting observation we made was that as to which network has kind of the upper edge, seemed to be in line with the resolution field of view trade-off that we might expect for different organelles. So for example, larger things like the nucleus, the mitochondria, tend to do better with the eight nanometer network, which has a larger field of view. And classes that are smaller, more detailed, such as mitochondria membrane, seem to perform better with the four nanometer network. So here, more resolution makes it easier to get the exact placement right, which is crucial for the dice score performance. And in a sim similar fashion, the microtubules, which are quite thin and which logically require a higher resolution, perform better with the four nanometer network. So on the bottom here is another HeLa cell imaged at eight nanometers, um, which should be pretty similar to our training data. And the segmentation seems to work great there, so that's nice. Uh, but what's really encouraging is that we also were able to get decent results on this mouse quivered plexus data set on the top which is chemically fixed tissue, so quite different from the samples that we trained on. Um, another interesting aspect to the eight nanometer networks was it allowed us to get segmentations of existing correlative light and electron microscopy data sets, such as were published in, in the Hoffman science paper not too long ago. So there, John was able to use, um, use them to automate the alignment between the EM and the LM data. Um, so as you can see here for this COS7 cell, so as we zoom in here, uh, what you'll see is the deformable part of the alignment as we're switching between the original FIMSIM and the FIBSIM aligned to the LM data. So more specifically, John used the mitomembrane segmentation, which will show up in orange, and then he generated images that looked like the LM data by downsampling and applying an anisotropic Gaussian blur to, mim to mimic the PSF of the light mi microscope. So those images are then automatically aligned uh, to the LM mitos. Um, and as you can see, the, they match up quite nicely. So we'll look here a little bit more closely at this region um, and walk through it again uh, in a little slower. So if we look at the mitochondria here, um, you can see the, the blue, and blue is the palm fluorescence um, of the mitochondria membrane. 
So John used this fluorescence and registered to the MITRE predictions, which are here in orange, um, by doing first an affine and then a nonlinear warp. So the ER that is shown here is aligned independently, um, so it's just the result of the mitochondria alignment. We looked at the Jacobian determinant of the transformation field to measure the local distortion that resulted from this registration. And you know, as you can see here, the um, in both the single slice, which is the whole cell image there, and the histogram over the whole volume, the distribution is, has a nice narrow standard deviation, so it indicates that the transformation was nice and smooth. We also evaluated the registration accuracy with respect to human-generated ground truth. This is kind of my favorite part. So for this, we used the ER to compare since um, it was independent of the, the mitochondria alignment that was done automatically. So this enabled us to measure errors in an unbiased way with respect to the true underlying transformation, not just the part of the transformation that can be inferred from where the mitochondria membrane channel lies. So specifically what John did here was he manually placed 31 landmark pairs to align the ER and the light data to the uh, EM data in this boxed region. He then gave me the unregistered images and half of the pair. So I knew where the point was placed in the LM data, but I didn't know where it was in the EM data. So after I aligned the two images using the ER in both the LM and EM, um, using his landmarks, we compared the results between the two of us, as well as our combined results to the automatic approach. And then this is all summarized in the graph or in the image there on the bottom left. So here, the horizontal white line shows how the automated registration differs from the ground truth human de uh, decision. So automated versus human. And the vertical white lines show how the human evaluators differ from each other. And this is at each of the 31 points that John, John and I placed down. So on average, the automatic registration differed from the human annotator by about 110 nanometers. And note that this is only two to three pex pixels in X and Y in the LM data and about a pixel in the Z. So really pretty good. Um, and then John and I differed from each other, which I was very proud of this. We only differed from each other by an average of 30 nanometers. Um, but that's still 30 nanometers. And so this really shows that the human derived ground truth to measure accuracy is really a pretty biased approach. Um, but at the end of the day, what was important is that the automated registration agrees more with John and I um, in areas with clear mitochondria signals. So if you look here, you can see that um, you know, up here in this upper right, uh, the automated versus human has more disagreement because there's no mitochondria there for the automated method to align. But in places where there's nice ER and nice mitochondria, you can see that there is little error between the automated versus human and the human versus human errors. So we also took this one step further, and because this data set had both palm and sim, we could compare the alignment between two light modalities as well. So you can see here the map of the spatial error between those two transformations. So we're comparing the transformation between um, using palm as the LM alignment or using sim as the LM alignment. Um, and the histogram of the spatial error of a region where the cells are present, so where the white outline of the cells are there. Overall, the errors are pretty small, um, especially near mitochondria, which is to be expected. Um, which indicated to us that really the registration is consistent across the modalities. So altogether, we show that using automatic organelle segmentations can be used to successfully register CLEM images and make it accessible to less experienced users and reducing the time from days to an hour or less. So I should mention, though, that this is really the best case scenario. The extent to which the alignment process can be automated really depends, which may not be a surprise, but it really depends on the quality of the data. So sometimes we'll have to manually tweak things. You know, one thing that happens with LM data is not all the cells are transfected. Um, and so things like that, the cells would have to be masked out because in EM, you do see everything. Um, but even, you know, even having the predictions in place, and I can personally attest to this, having to had to align several of these data sets with and without predictions, um, even in the worst case scenario, having the segmentations really speeds up the pro process tremendously and it makes it much less cumbersome. So 
most importantly, uh, all of this work is made publicly available through our open access portal, Open Organel, uh, with the data hosted by AWS. So here, together with the HES Lab and the FIBSEM Technology Group, we provide a browsable and soon to be queryable interface for people to explore these EM data sets and the accompanying uh, segmentation. So you can browse pre-made views or customize your own view views based on what you want to see. You can explore the data using Neuroglancer. The data is set up in a multi-resolution pyramid schema, which allows for fast online browsing. Um, and if you're interested in the details of all this, David would be more than eager to share. Um, we also provide tools for anyone to download any or all of our data, if they so dare, because these are rather large, um, including the raw data, the training data, the segmentations, and the analysis. Um, and the Software Lab has also implemented implemented in five capabilities in Fiji, so anyone can read any of this data from the AWS server right on their computer. We have tutorials available and have provided a glossary of sorts containing a definition, an example of each object class for each data set. So what I'm showing here is the center zone, for example. Um, and then we also link out to our GitHub repositories where all of the tools, models, and source code are available as well. So, of course, at the end of the day, the ultimate goal of COSIM is to segment all organelles in e EM data. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and this is really only just the beginning. Um, we do have a pipeline in place now getting us started, and while we, of course, try to continuously improve every aspect of it, we're also seeking to understand what else is needed to max maximize the impact of this work. So, for instance, how much training data is needed for a new data set and how much proofreading is required, how generalizable are our analysis methods in new data sets. So for this, we're branching out to help answer some of these important questions. So we're collaborating with the Advanced Imaging Center here at Janilia, um, who has their own FibSim and CryoClim system now. Um, we're transferring tools and knowledge there. We're continuing to generate and integrate more training data from a variety of data sets um, a majority of which includes tissue, because um, that's where the real excitement is, I suppose, such as um, what I'm showing here is from the Drosophila VNC. And we're also applying our analysis methods to help quantitate segmentations from outside groups, because let's be honest, the real work only just become, begins once you have the segmentations in hand. So with all of that, I would really like to thank the group. With, um, without this group, um, all of this work would not be possible. They're an incredible collaborative um, team, and you can find all this information in our preprint on bioarchive. Um, and really, this would not be possible without the larger support um, of administration and labs and support teams that, that are available here at Genelia. And with that, I will try to unshare. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Aubrey. That was uh, quite inspiring um, and uh, scary, frightening, uh, but but very inspiring. So I'll start with a question, kind of an open question for you. And this is it's it's a it's a large group of people. There's a lot of um, complementary disciplines that come together to, to create such a project. It's really amazing. I, I, I think there's probably only a handful of places in the world where this could actually come together. Uh, and where you are is, is one of them, clearly. Now, you're, with, these, with this work, you are rediscovering cell biology, really. So I, I'm curious, from a kind of a high school student point of view, uh, from that frame of mind back many years ago, what did you find out that was surprising from a biology point of view uh, that that made you rethink how textbooks are are prepared and and still taught today? Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that I even miss in light data, right? I mean, I think i I grew up as a fluorescent microscopist and and so, Seeing EM data is one thing, because uh, it's busy, it's noisy, there's stuff everywhere. But seeing it segmented and seeing all the organelles together and then comparing that to what you see and know from light data, it's really kind of a, you know, this, this mind-blowing thing like, wow, like everything's touching everything. Um, 
And so then to try to take that information and and tease apart, you know, like what true connections are and what like connect. It's just this huge probability space. Um, it's super exciting. <laughs> and what, what so on that's yeah on the biology I, I guess that's just the beginning EM is already a, a treasure trove of data and now you added another layer which is all the segmentation and and there's perhaps a, a decade or even longer of work to actually pry that apart and try to understand what what is actually there but what about what about on the same question but on the computer vision side of things machine learning in computer vision was there something surprising that you or your collaborators identified when you were going through the process go wow this really it works like this it's you know surprising to us that it's like that yeah i think um maybe for us it was that um, so the so my my naivety as a um compu computer vision um scientist which i am not <laughs> is going to show now but i i think what maybe was surprising is that it just worked Right. So, so the software lab use used the um, their distance transform method that they use for detecting synapses, and Larissa really just just took that infrastructure and applied it here. And we tried some different scenarios of you know trying you know, all the classes at once versus some versus one, um, and and we were secretly hoping that all classes would do better, right? Because you don't want to train 37 networks and then have to figure out how to combine them. So it was nice that training more together was helpful. But but it also was was just nice that it that it worked, right? And I think what we found is that getting the infrastructure in place was really the the mountain of a task that was hard. Um, and now we're to a place where, where once we have something in place, we can do the exciting things, right? Like iterate on, on new and clever machine learning tricks and hacks and, and, and things there, right? Like I'm sure that, that Shefflin and Marissa have plenty of things that they want to investigate there, but, but we really had to get everything in place first before we could even start on that. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, this I see there's at least one question posted there, and there's one other that somebody asked me privately to ask you. So one one is about uh, the the data is are the data the, the deep learning models the the trained models that you have are they available publicly available? And I, I understood yes, uh, but could you uh, kind of yeah. show or or mention yeah, where they, people could go and get them? Yeah, they should be available on um our on the software lab GitHub repo, um, you're more than welcome. Um, all the information is linked out on GitHub. So if you don't find what you need there, I believe there is a contact for um, COSIM data at Janilia.org and you can most definitely email any one of us or the COSIM data email um, to find information. Because if this was um, a lot of stuff to make available and we're still in the process of like, you know, updating and making it user friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So if there's something we missed or something you need, just always reach out. All right, very good. The other question from uh, Matthias uh, Haberl. Um, well, first, excellent talk. Could you comment a bit on where the main errors come from um, for the more difficult structures like microtubules? That's the first part. And the second, and what do you see as the way forward to improve the predictions on those structures? Yeah, so um, more training data. <laughs> I think that's I think that's going to be our solution for almost everything. So when we started this, um, one thing that we thought might happen is that it, it would be hard to generalize, right? So you know, with a biologist frame of mind, um, a lot of us thought like, you know, there's no way that we're going to be able to look at a HeLa cell and then look at tissue and it's going to be completely different, right? Like those are completely different systems, stupid cancer cell to something relevant. Um, but then what we notice is that if you zoom in really close, a mitochondria still looks like a mitochondria, right? The Christie may be a little denser or darker, but you can still discern what it is. And, and so could the machine. And so what was more important wasn't necessarily the type of data, but the variability between the data sets. So each of these data sets come with their own staining protocols, with their own imaging parameters, and, 
at this point, we weren't involved in the data collection. We were just kind of mining all the data that had already been produced. Um, so, you know, moving forward, I think, you know, having a more iterative process there um, will be really um, helpful and also just being able to explore that parameter space as well, right? To know that you know, this imaging parameter will result in this type of better segmentation, for instance. Um, I think that these are, this is all metadata information that we can probe for sure. <laughs> Very good. And on, on the annotation side, there's a question about that. And I was also curious, you did mention the comparison between you and your uh, collaborator that is basically a couple of pixels. Is but uh, I think people are trying to understand, is that essential or can the collaborators have a bigger, um, like be more heterogeneous? If you had 10 annotators and they had, uh, let's say three or four pixels of divergence between them, would it still work? I think the answer is gonna be yes. And I think because the difference between annotators is going to be masked by the data noise. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. So, you know, the places where they're going to differ from each other as the places where it's just hard to discern, period. So, you know, like ER membrane that's all mm -hmm. moving around each other and not staying super crisp or, um, you know, just out of focus in that area. Those are going to be hard to distinguish. And so that's where your your discrepancies are going to come from. And I think even without I mean, that eat the machine as well is going to have issues there, not necessarily because of training, but because just because the data is noisy there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And th there's a, there's a follow up question to this, uh, which is also applicable to what Hari talked about, which is when you're studying something, you know what it is, is one story. When you are studying something, you don't know what it is, and you're counting on automatic segmentation done by an AI entity, as uh, in, you know, in this case, um, how can you trust it? Uh, if it's something new that nobody has yet discovered, uh, how how tricky is that to identify? Yeah. So I mean, so everything we're doing is supervised, right? Um, definitely. You know, I know that there are you know, approaches, and even at Janilia, to to mine these data sets to find mm -hmm. unique patterns um, mm -hmm. to, to show you an area in these huge data sets uh, that could be interesting. Um, so for us, I think that this is where the analysis comes in, right? So um, you can see a distribution of sizes and volumes. And if you have suddenly a mitochondria that was really small, this could be an error that it was mislabeled, or it could be an interesting mitochondria. And so it serves as a red flag either to fix or to, you know, find new things. Um, and so, so in that way, the analysis is sort of serving as um, our flagging system, both for finding new unique things as well as fixing things that are just incorrect. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're getting to the end. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Let me do a final check here on my chat dashboard. Uh, no, it doesn't look like there's anything else. So, Aubrey, uh, thank you so much for the presentation and for covering the outstanding work done by the, the COSAM team uh, and wider collaborators. It sounds like it's coming to the AIC, so that means more people will be able to use this kind of approach. That's great. Um, so congratulations to the whole team.